the maker movement, I think, is going to be the big benefactor of this isolation. Now, when you get the maker movement combined with the important social and cultural movement of the um, racial equality, you have the ability for people to really use their creativity to promote something that's of core value to the society. And so I think that those two major components of what we're going through right now have the potential for a lot of individuals to feel it has two kinds of powers. It has the power with the creativity and the ability to connect out socially. It has the ability to affect positive change. This time on the Plutopia News Network, artist, art historian, and educator Honoria Starbuck joins John and Scoop in the virtual studio. We discuss her art, her influences, art education, and Zen chickens. Honoria Starbuck, our guest today, is a professor of practice in the School of Design and Creative Technologies in the College of Fine Arts at the University of Texas. She's also an artist known for her vibrant watercolors and especially for her Zen Chicken series, which we'll discuss today. Honoria, hello. How are you? Quack, 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 quack. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was the Zen Chickens talking. Sorry. There you go. So I guess the way to, to start, especially when we're talking to someone who is uh, an accomplished artist, as you are, is to talk about your influence. What What are some of the influences you've had on your work? Well, that's a rather broad question. So my influences are art history, like the whole thing. So I'll give you some examples. So um, starting with cave paintings? Yes, definitely okay. cave paintings. I mean, cave paintings are a huge influence. And you, you just wonder what they're trying to say. And they're, they're, they're very abstract. Like when Picasso walked into the caves, he looked around after having discovered cubism. And he said, we have progressed not at all. We, or they were already there in the caves. So my main influences are like Rodin and his really fast gesture drawings. And then from there, Zen calligraphy and uh, cave paintings, and then some of the German expressionists, and, and uh, like Emil Nolde is one of them for his super saturated colors. Emil? Emil Nolde, N-O-L-D-E. He did amazing, really intense watercolors. Well, in, like how long ago was he practicing? Uh, well, he got sequestered by the Nazis. Uh, ah. So it was in World War II. And, and there's several different versions of his story in relationship to uh, the German authorities. But one of them, one of the complimentary ones, is that he was banished to the, uh, to the countryside where he created these absolutely amazing watercolors because he couldn't paint in oil because people would be able to smell the oil and they would accuse him of degenerate painting. Wow. That's very interesting. Yeah. As you talk about that, I keep thinking about some of the, I'm seeing some actually pretty great art on sidewalks. Oh, I've been watching you as you've been posting them. Those the yeah. pictures. Those are yeah. very interesting, you know, and, and, uh, it's just kind of like wandering around the neighborhood. Every so often you'll encounter some chalk art on the sidewalk. And sometimes it's it's pretty primitive and other times it can be kind of pedestrian. But sometimes it's kind of amazing. It seems like it's actually a urban version of the cave paintings. It's just a, a new yeah. version. Yeah, well, we're always doing cave paintings. Finger well, paintings, may, every you know, the handprints on the caves are the same. They're finger paintings. Well, that, uh, you know, the idea of sort of like uh, distributed folk art kind of stuff it makes me think about uh, your work in mail art. Can you tell us a little bit about your background in mail art and how mail art works? Because I think a lot of people may not even know about it. Well, mail art, it's mail like the postal system not like men. Yeah. Um, 
It's very much alive, and it's got a history that go, it's an international network of artists who've been exchanging art since way before the internet. So it goes back to the 50s, and it's artists sending art to other artists. So it subverts the gallery and museum system, and it's very direct. And right now, because of the pandemic, it's having a resurgence. And there have been a lot of articles written recently about mail art because people can still do mail art. And it's got a low barrier to entry and it gets you away from Zoom and the, and the computers and it, and it connects very much to the maker movement. So you make something and you send it through the postal system. So someone else makes something and sends it through the postal systems. And it's, it forms a giant network. Well, my, my recollection is, correct me if I'm wrong, that when an artist receives a, a piece of mail art, they'll often do their own thing to transform it a bit more, to add more to it, augment it, and then send it on to another artist. Is that correct? That's very common strategy. And there's something called add and pass, which means add something to it and pass it on. And that is a subset of mail art. There's all kinds of subsets of mail art. Where, where do the mail art pieces sort of end up? Just various artists have their own collections? Yeah, uh, mail artists call them archives. So some mail artists archive them and have a big archive. And a lot of them, the ones who've been doing it for a long time, have donated their archives to various institutions. Like I've got work through John Hill Jr.'s archive that's in the Smithsonian Institution. Wow. Do and they uh, do gallery showings of, uh, of mail art? Has anyone uh, or organized a gallery presentation? Occasionally a gallery will sponsor a mail art show, but usually it's private people. But, I mean, I've been in the Venice Biennale three times, too, because Ruggiero Maggi in Milan, he has an affiliation with... Um, he makes a Tibetan pavilion at the Biennale and he calls for male artists to contribute. So it's, it's, you never know what's going to happen. Like anybody could sponsor a male art show, including a museum and some museums have done it, in which case the male art ends up in their collection. And this, uh, as I recall, was an influence on a sort of computer mediated version of network art that's that's transmitted over the internet is that correct no i don't think so i think they there's no think, real relationship between those things well the mail artists have um, colonized the internet in a lot of different ways but i don't think the internet art was specifically directly related, although some male artists were pretty early, like Mark Block in New York. He was a very early um, bulletin board uh, community manager, and, he was, and, and his background was in male art. But I think they pretty much, that the techie people sort of ignored the male artist, and the male artist kind of ignored the techie people except when they wanted to, except when it opened up to be more um, accessible to people around the world. Like at first, if you weren't associated with a university or had money to buy these network computers, you couldn't really participate in networked art. And male artists felt that the mail art was more, uh, de you know, democratic and egalitarian so it was more open than computers were. And now the, the idea has shifted since more and more people have access to computers that it's now considered that a lot of people have access to the internet. And so what male artists have done is they have groups, like there's a bunch of Facebook groups and they're very active and they post mail art that they receive through the postal system. <laughs> So they will they will take a picture of it, digitize it, and put it on the internet. And, and there's a lot of mail art on the internet now. I know where I got the impression that there was a connection. It was uh, uh, through uh, you remember the art community online community called Otis, which later changed its name to Cito. I think because the elevator company had <laughs> issues or something, and they uh, they did something kind of like ad and pass. They there would be 
uh, I forget they had a name for it. I can't remember what the name was, but um, at at a particular point in time, they would start passing pieces of art around to each other and and various artists would collaboratively alter the the piece of art or I guess really add to the piece of art so it was kind of like add and pass and I I had an experience with that at a robo fest here in Austin when the late Bob Anderson was around and um, he uh, was part of CETO and they had organized uh, uh, their own part of RoboFest, even though they were distributed all over the world, really. Um, Bob was shooting digital images at RoboFest and passing them over to the CETO community, and they were making their alterations. Yeah, I think it's pretty common to do collaboration in no matter what. You get a bunch of people together, like the Surrealists did it with the exquisite corpses. And mm. it's also said that the cave painters did it with the layers on the cave. So yeah, I don't think know, it's not new. <laughs> but so often people think in terms of like a solitary artist working alone. And that's almost never the truth, right? The right. artists tend to communicate and influence each other. And same with, I mean, that's true of literary art, and that's true also of visual art. Right. Well, that's what they call it, the impressionist or the expressionist instead of the impressionist singular. It's a group of people who decide that, you know, that they kind of identify with an experimental direction. And they share their enthusiasm with each other, and uh, boom, a new art movement is born. Honoria, uh, you're an art educator, and I fear yeah. that's a endangered species, if you will, that so much of the cuts in education these days, art and music seem to be the first victims. What's your uh, view of the current state of art education? Well, in the K-12 world, that's very true. But in the um, but there's also simultaneously a a new emphasis on something called creativity. And so there's in K-12 education, which is kindergarten through 12th grade, and especially public education, there's a movement called STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. But like you just noticed, it leaves out art. And so there's a simultaneous movement called STEAM, which puts the art in STEM. And, and there's kind of just a battle going, which is it, it, it will come back because I think it's really important for, for the acquisition and for the integration of all the STEM stuff to have the art as a way of, of sort of solidifying and pulling it together and feeling what the relationships are. And that's where the creativity can, can, can flourish in a way that's personal to, to each student. When, so yay, uh, STEAM. <laughs> when I listen to budget debates, uh, especially in uh, Texas, the – subject of well what are we going to cut comes up and immediately somebody will say well art and music uh, they don't really need that they can get them a, a job at mcdonald's or whatever <laughs> and that's disheartening you know my a younger sister spent 40 years as a elementary teacher and our mother was an artist and so she tried to promote art education at that level and the resistance from school boards would just, you know, she, she would just basically have to buy her own supplies and sneak in art lessons. Yeah, that's what teachers do. Uh, what they value will, will definitely get into the classroom because it, their commitment is to the students, right? And if they feel like they're not giving the students a well-rounded education, they're going to figure a way to do it. I think that the artist in the schools program is a way of kind of getting around that, of bringing artists in as as guests, and hopefully there's a little budget to pay them, and that way the students get 
uh, a multitude of, of music, art, and, and whatever else, uh, poetry, et cetera. <laughs> So I, I think that that's a way of getting around the official um, rejection of the arts, you might say, because it's not valued. But really, when you look back in history, you look back and you see the creative parts, like we listen to Beethoven, we don't know every mathematical equation that was being done during that time. Yet you can understand math by listening to Beethoven. So you can see relationships of, of frequencies. You can understand science. You can understand um, physics by listening to uh, a great artist. Especially if you really listen. Yeah. Because sometimes we just hear music, but we don't really listen to it. That's a good point. Yeah, spending some time in close observation is one of the things I teach so that you can start to see the moving parts of any creative project. Do you, is it a challenge teaching that as people are kind of more ADD now? Um, no, that's actually relaxing. Like I teach mindfulness as part of my design class. And people realize, especially for instance, a video game, let's, because a lot of my students want to make video games. So a video game is made out of so many moving parts. So including audio, which you guys are, are expert in. And then there's music background. There's the, the rhythm of the game. There's the uh, writing of the story. And then there's the visual components, both the foreground and the character design and the background, whatever's going on in the background, which involves all kinds of, of design decisions. So once they they say, I've got to stop this video game and start to move my mind from being a consumer into a producer, then they realize that each one of those component parts of whatever video game they are addicted to at the moment is a slider in Photoshop or some kind of manipulation in Maya or some kind of uh, a variation in a music program. And then they, they realize that all this has to work together. And the main shift is, is mental from a, from a naive consumer to a sophisticated professional producer. There's a whole bunch of little steps. And so that's how I, I get to them. Like what's their end goal to make a video game. And so we're going to pull back and examine all the steps to make that successful change in their world from being a consumer to being a producer. How do you relate that to the concept of mindfulness? Just that, it's in your mind. You have shifted from being a video game player to understanding all the component parts. So you have to you have to be mindful of the color. You have to be mindful of the shapes. You have to be mindful of the space. You have to be mindful of the rhythm. And so I, I, I kind of break it down into being mindful of all the singular parts that make up the whole experience. I fear that uh, a lot of people enter into these kind of projects uh, without actually thinking through wh what they're really going to do and, and doing planning. They just figure they can just go in and do it. And uh, a musician I interviewed years ago, Robert Fripp, said something that impressed me. He said that uh, good intentions don't necessarily yield good art. Yeah, I think so. But without the intention, you, do, you don't have a vision, you don't have motivation. So wherever you start, you'll soon learn that it's more complicated than you thought. So you saw the whole, but you saw the whole without the parts. And so um, what the students, what my job is, is to, to start them owning the relationship of the parts to the whole. That's what I do. So often you see intention sort of uh, morph through execution. I mean, intention has to adapt itself, right? So you start out with one intention, but as you move through the process of creation, um, the original intention 
maybe isn't really lost, but it just sort of cha- can change or mutate. It helps well, to be John, flexible. <laughs> yeah. So, John, what you just did was you you defined mindfulness in how to create uh, a piece of art. Interesting. <laughs> and I didn't even know I was doing that. Yeah. So when you when you ask people to think about a subject like this, ba- you through the lens of their own end goal, then they can start to ch- make that mindful shift. And that mindful shift, you know, one of the components of mindfulness is self-awareness. Yeah, it's true. And as you become aware of yourself and aware of your your thoughts and your mind and how it works, one thing that is clear is that it's it's not static and it's not permanent and it's not consistent, but it changes. Yep. It does. Wow. It grows. And so as an educator, your goal is to help students explore those parts. Those They're sort of parallel parts of the creative process. And they build cumulatively until you get to the point where you can do something original. You were teaching um, online for a, a while. Um, yes. Um, were there challenges in teaching art and doing it mostly online? Oh yeah. <laughs> and I'm doing it again now because Oh yeah, of the, you, yeah, because of COVID. Yeah. And so those skills are really coming back, but the the main challenge is as you know because we're doing it right now is not being in the same room and getting all those visual cues from the students. So the idea of the um, asynchronous kind of activities that you can assign before the class and after the class and making potentiating the time you have with the students to be really productive is the big trick. Are you using something like Zoom for those classes? Yes, we use Zoom for the synchronous part, and we use a learning management system for the asynchronous part. Something like Moodle? It's called Canvas. The University of Texas uses Canvas, yes. Have you uh, discovered any tools or processes or or approaches that have really worked for you that might be helpful to other people having to teach online? Yes, improv. So... I did a project with my students that was based on the yes and improv game. And I made a table in Google, in a shared Google form. No, not a form, a a document. And one column was yes and the other column was and. And so then I showed the students a uh, illustration that one of the other students had selected. And they had to write what they saw, like the component parts I was telling you about. Like if they saw color relationships in the yes column, they would say, I see color relationships, but they couldn't put the and in there. Some other student had to put the and in there. And so, the, for example, I see color relationships, and I see color relationships right now in your background and your foreground, right? So I see a repetition. So I would say, I see color relationships in Scoop's uh, image. And then someone else, another student would say what the relationships are. So I see a repetition of the color white in your beard and in your nebula and in the stars. <laughs> and so what, the, what that does is it creates a sense of unity. So I see the white being repeated several places in your image. And then someone else might see, I see a strong contrast between the white of your, so you see contrast is another of our tech, of our vocabulary terms and so I see strong contrast and so they would say what the contrast did the contrast creates a very distinct foreground and background it it sounds like you're teaching observational skills which is uh, really important in a lot of fields to learning to observe and to decide what's going on in whatever you're observing Yeah, so it's like that when you asked me to test the levels of the microphone, you were observing um, a relationship of the frequencies and the intensity of the sound because you have an expert vision. And so it's it's trying to develop that 
that level of attention so that the students are empowered to make the right decisions. So this might be a good time to talk about Zen chickens. All right. <laughs> We've talked a lot about how you teach art and a little bit about how you uh, are influenced, but you're, I think you, most much of your art recently has been in this Zen Chicken series. Can yeah, you been, say a little bit about that? Yeah, I've been doing Zen Chickens for about three years. And Zen Chickens are really close observation because I can watch the ink dry. <laughs> hmm. But uh, the Zen Chickens came out of my interest in my practice of Tai Chi. So Tai Chi is moving meditation and ink drawing and calligraphy are, is also moving meditation. And that's how I see them. I see both of them as part of the same thing. So um, the Zen chickens just popped up one day. It's like I was, I was doing Zen circles or endos. I was practicing that kind of calligraphy and I have a number of um, Japanese calligraphy brushes, which are really fun to use. And I was watching videos of how to draw. And one of the classic things to draw, they teach you in these you know, training videos, is how to draw roosters and chickens and chicks. So I started playing around with that. And then all of a sudden, the two combined. So the, the spontaneous of the Zen circles started to grow feet chicken feet and and chicken heads and rooster tails and the rest is history so i've been doing that for three years and um, i actually have some zen chicken videos on youtube so if you go to honoria studio zen chickens you'll see it and zen chicken holiday are my zen chicken christmas cards from last year so you can actually look at them on my YouTube channel. How many Zen chickens are there now? Have you been counting? No, I have not, but I've got them in boxes and they're labeled by year. So I think they go back to, to 2018, maybe 17, but I think in 17, I was still doing the circles, but there's definitely eight, 2018, 19 and 20. Do you still do circles as well? Yeah, I do. I, I do circles on top of chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> to yeah. get to the circle. <laughs> yeah, to get the, to the flying white. So, you know, it's really interesting. At the end of a circle, the uh, brush runs out of ink. And when it runs out of ink, it, it stops being a, a full line and becomes a, a spackled line. And that spackled line when it's running out of ink is called the flying white. I love it. I love this stuff. The flying white. The flying white, yeah. Because wow. the, the white flies into the line. I presume that these uh, Zen chicken uh, watercolors were influenced by Zen calligraphy. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Well, yeah, they were. I, I, actually, there's one calligrapher they were influenced by specifically, and he is this really funny, uh, very humorous Zen monk, and he's in Sedona, Arizona, and his name is Aluk Su, A-L-O-K-H-S-U, and he is a big inspiration. He's, he giggles, and he looks deep into your eyes, and he'll do a portrait of you, a spontaneous Zen portrait. And his enjoyment of putting ink on paper is so palpable. It just comes through the videos. And I, I really love that guy. I'd, I'd like to go meet him. Oh, you haven't met him yet? Oh, no, I've just seen videos of him. I don't really want to because I have this, this mental image of what it would be like and I think it would be less like that. Than... Anyhow, I have Tai Chi teachers who have the same effect on me. Like they are just the energy of them energizes my creative spirit. 
Yeah, I wanted to talk about your relationship with Chi, too. You've been doing Tai Chi for quite a while, right? Yes, I have. Um, so Chi, my relationship to Chi is through martial arts. And I use it creatively with the Zen chickens. I just sit there and wait with a loaded brush. And then when the, the moment hits, I do a spontaneous ink drawing. And with, with the martial art of Tai Chi, I've learned how to move negative energy away from me. I can see it coming, and I move it away from me, which is very good for a teacher. So if a student looks at you with that, you don't know what you're talking about, look in their eye, you can just like use, move that chi to the side and not be judgmental about that person and just meet them where they are and ask them a question that will open up what they really think. So chi is a powerful, just knowing that it's there is powerful. You say that you see it coming. Is it, is it more seeing or more feeling? Uh, seeing it. You, you can just like you, well, with students, you can see it. You can see in their body language. It's also like neuro-linguistic programming. You just kind of, you can work with whatever uh, is coming at you in, in a martial art way. So the way that Tai Chi is, it's like you're, you're like literally moving the invading person who, who might be fighting you, you know, you're moving them out of the way while you're maintaining your balance. And that happens in the classroom, um, both ne positive and negative. You have someone who really understands the concept and they want to show off. And so their chi is going to be uh, very ego driven. And then you have other people who are very negative. And then you have other people who are unsure of themselves and they they, they're afraid to ask a question. So all that is in the umbrella of chi. It sounds like a very good tactic or skill to use in any interpersonal relationship rather than attacking each other, trying to gain some understanding. Yeah, I think if, if Congress <laughs> all took Tai Chi classes, we'd be in better shape. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> In Aikido, they talk about blending with the energy of your opponent. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. So I'm sure this relates to flow and the way that you use flow in your work. Yes, it does. So, yeah, everything's moving. And with it's, it's kind of fascinating the way India Inc. will the pigments will be distributed in the water. And recently my husband gave me a new pigment. It's called black 3.0 and it's the blackest black you ever saw. And a lot of times it's in an acrylic medium, but a lot of times um, acrylic is made out of plastic, right? And it will bond together and it won't flow like India ink will flow, separate and flow because it's carbon separated into water. But this, this black 2.0 acrylic, it, it dissolves like water. I'm in water like India ink and it makes the most amazingly subtle um, versions of, yeah, that's it. Um, it's just amazing. And so it, ha it has the quality of more black and more matte than India ink. And it's just, it's, I love it. So I recommend that, you know, if you're just getting in the flow of dropping color into a glass of water and watching it or spilling some water and dropping some ink on the water and just watching it, that's something that you can learn from. I'm looking at the description of Black 3.0. It says uh, absorbs up to 99% of visible light. It's very black. It sort of reminds me of a, there was a comic book thing. I can't remember which comic it was, but these guys would carry around holes with them. Yeah. And then they'd put the hole on the ground and there would be a hole there. That, that, those were the thugs in Donald Duck comic books. That shows oh, yeah, that we, Beagle Boys. Yes, we have, we have similar art taste when it comes to comic <laughs> books. 
<laughs> that's funny. Back well, back. that's like the opposite of a Zen circle. It's like that's it, the emptiness, right? It's the same thing. I have an artist friend in San Francisco, a uh, uh, well-known comic book artist, but also a, a serious, you know, gallery artist, and he did a whole. A showing at a gallery in San Francisco of black velvet paintings, including the obligatory uh, Elvis on black velvet. Of course, it was the old overweight Elvis, but it was one of the most astounding things. It was all just black canvases that he had treated with various uh, uh, illustrations. Yeah, velvet paintings are interesting because they both, it depends on the velvet, because silk velvet um, is more reflective than cotton velvet. And so uh, you get a very different surface. And, and it's very interesting, the different blacks, too. And this black 3.0 is very matte. So it's like the cotton velvet. It's very, it just absorbs the light, like John said. Do you uh, incorporate black a lot in, say, the Zen chickens, or do you tend to be more colorful? Oh, most of them are black on a white background with vermilion. So vermilion is the classic Chinese and Japanese uh, signature chop. And so um, they use the, the... the chops are positive and negative, and in mine, mine is so that you chop and put the red stamp onto the. That's your signature, or it could be some poetry. You chop it, um, and you have a vermilion stamp on your white background with a black ink drawing. And I do the opposite. I put my a fingerprint of a smear of vermilion, and then I put white. I put my signature in white. And then I also do the comb of the rooster in vermilion. So there's usually two chunks of vermilion, which is a bright orangey red and black ink on a white paper. Although sometimes I do very colorful Zen chickens too. Vermilion is kind of a cinnamon red, right? It's a very bright. Cinnamon is like darker. So why do you think spontaneous creativity is compelling? I've, I've heard you say this before. Because we, you were talking earlier about the motivation and the end product. So all of that starts somewhere. And it usually starts um, kind of when you see something you want to do and you imitate it. So you were talking about comic book. Comic book kids who read comic books, a lot of times they want to start drawing comic books. It's a very quick step. You know, you, you read them and then you want to make your own. Yeah. And, and so the first thing you do is imitate. And then you make variations. And then you will combine, say, well, I, what if I want Superman and a Ninja Turtle together, you know, and you start combining them. And that starts to transform. And the more you copy, the more you, you get muscle memory about drawing. And you also, ideas come to you as you're drawing one thing. You go, well, what if I did this? And you make small variations until finally the end result is you've actually uh, created something that's original. And that's actually a taxonomy that teachers can use. So you can take these steps in your teaching in order to build towards originality. So spontaneously, spontaneity starts when you first have an idea, right? But that that idea is very separated from your abilities, your current abilities, because you always have ideas, what if, you know? It's, it's beyond. That's why it's creative, because somebody has to create it. And it pretty much defaults to you have to create it. And how do you create it? So you start with rough drafts. And those rough drafts are deliberately experimental. They're not the end goal. They're just the beginning. And so a lot of students, they're, they, they want to get quickly to the, their ideals, and it's a teacher's, and that's the way Tai Chi comes in, it's a teacher's goal 
to let them go through all these uh, iterations so that they can get to the point where they have the strength to be original. I've seen some uh, exhibits of those pre- preparatory uh, steps toward the finished product you know, of various artists, and it was fascinating to see just the little line, you know, line or pencil drawings progressing up to a finished painting. Yeah, and so people usually don't see those, and to me, they're the they're the nutty the nitty gritty of what. Uh, where the creativity is because it's that's where the creativity how these things change as they move towards the finished product the finished product is usually more actually conservative and outward facing than the um the preparatory sketches some of the ones that they showed were just you know amazing they uh, several versions didn't relate it entirely to the uh, finished product but they Good. were charming and i think a lot of people may suppress you know, disclosing that step because they would want to come off as i just did this great work of art uh, in a moment you know rather than through many steps yeah it's very interesting scoop that's a good point but artist, when I said the Rodin was one of my influences at the beginning, artists love that stuff. So fellow artists will be less interested in the finished product than they will be to the to the steps towards it, because that's where the real experimentation, that's where the conversation, the creative conversation can really take place with artists. And I think that's why they get together and, and form these movements, because they're, they're at an experimental uh, point all at the same time, and they can to share all these steps. Whereas the finished product, that's what goes in the gallery, or that's what goes into the movie. Whereas the storyboards, they sit behind. And, yeah. and artists love storyboards, you know, that's where the real story is. Yeah, I'm thinking about how hard it was for me to understand it in writing. The first draft is really a lump of clay, right? Right, yeah. And you kind of start with the idea that you're going to write something and it's going to be there, but you got to do a lot of work with it once you've written it or as you write it. And yeah. the same is true, I'm sure, of any form of art. And I think that's what's missing in the, edu- the art education part is because in math you're supposed to – get to the end product but a lot of math teachers know you have to show your work you know and so that show your work part is the creative process so do you think that this uh, current pandemic apocalypse whatever it is will have an impact on on well on, for one thing on your art and then on art in general well yes it definitely will on because every well people are doing things in two different ways they're but let's just talk about the isolation so if you're feeling isolated you can get you can go through a lot of emotional changes and as you go through those emotional changes you if if you're really feeling them you are you're you're self-aware because you're you're looking inward and you're thinking about so people who are doing that eventually will have to come up with some kind of coping strategy and a lot of times those strategies the ones that at least that are shared on the internet which i've seen um, are creative so one of the examples of that is the people who are recreating all those famous paintings have you seen those? No. Oh, there's thousands of them. So people in their house will use all the things they have, the props that they have, and they will. Oh, I know what you're talking about now, yeah. the, the live recreation. Yeah, the live recreation of, of famous works of art, which you didn't even realize that so many people knew so much about art history. I mean, it's unbelievable. So they'll pick, you know, some some famous work of art from the Louvre or something, and they'll recreate it with the stuff they have. And um, so that that's the way isolation can lead to self-reflection and 
then the coping mechanism is when the creativity starts. And like I said, they're going through that creativity at the part where they're doing imitation. So once they do an imitation, they're learning all the working parts of this famous work of art. And so they're actually connecting to Rubens or Michelangelo or Vermeer. They're actually having a conversation with that artist by doing this close observation of their work. So that's a form of meditation. And then once people are doing this close observation of the creativity of the past, and it could be anything. It could be that they're learning something, watching YouTube tutorials or something. Then the maker movement, I think, is going to be the big benefactor of this isolation. Now, when you get the maker movement combined with the important social and cultural movement of the um, racial equality, you have the ability for people to really use their creativity to promote something that's of core value to the society. And so I think that those two major components of what we're going through right now have the potential for a lot of individuals to feel it has two kinds of powers. It has the power with the creativity and the ability to connect out socially. It has the ability to affect positive change. With the, and the opposite, the negative thing, you feel isolated and powerless. So um, I'm hoping that most people will, t will find that this self-reflective time of isolation and um, quarantine connecting to th this really important moment in society to change society for a more equal um, representation of all our citizens will cause a, a very strong creative eruption that 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 changes the way we see everything yeah i mean powerfully transformative social movements tend to have a aesthetic component yes uh, or or at least an aesthetic uh parallel and the strength of black aesthetics already existing is in already a, a powerful set of of visual elements to use. So I think we should pay attention to black artists, a lot of attention, and let those, that imagery and that music, the mu you know, the music and the imagery is so incredibly amazing that uh, we just have to make sure that it connects to the importance of all those cultural elements aesthetically and then move that power into the politics. Learn more about Honoria at honoriastarbuck.com or tune in to our Facebook page on Tuesday, July 14th, when she joins us for a live and lively discussion. You can stay in touch with Plutopia at plutopia.io. On Facebook, look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lubkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.